Hey, everyone. Uh, it's Joe Glines here in Dallas, Texas. And Jackie here from uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And, and today, I'm going to jump in here. We got uh, a colleague of ours, Charlie. Um, Charlie, uh, his, his uh, name on the forum is Tank, right? He runs the uh, forum. Tank, why don't you, I'm sure almost anyone watching this knows who you are, but why don't you give a little overview of who you are and um, your background? Okay. Uh, well, um, as Joe said, I'm Tank, and, and uh, I've uh, been operating the forum now for six years uh, uh, since I, I started this new forum. Uh, I also work in the uh, fascinating, exciting field of RPA, uh, and uh, I have been doing automation in one form or another now going on 15 years. Awesome. And um, Tank had moved to the same town, well, not same town, but the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, and so we ended up starting to talk a lot now. So it's been great. Um, and then Jackie, I just yell at him over in Denmark and, and we say hi. But um, so last week, I think it was right after we did our podcast, Jackie, is when I saw this video from Automation Anywhere on, it was actually an ad. I saw it on, on uh, YouTube. And so I recorded it and then I have the link. I'll give it to you in case anyone wants to watch it, but um, I've downloaded it so I, we can easily stop and start. And we don't have to worry about more ads popping up. But um, I sent it to, to Jackie and to, to Charlie because I thought um, for both of them, it's fun and interesting to see what this company is saying. And I know specifically though, because Tank used to, Tank, correct me if I'm wrong, used to actually install your, how do you phrase that? Did you, you didn't install automation anywhere, right? But you worked so we we build uh, and implement bots for with automation anywhere, uh, amongst other RPA tools. So cool, yeah. So he so he has a background in it. That's what, and I know from uh, previous discussions with him, uh, some of some of the stuff that he's mentioned of of its capabilities and frustration points, and so that's why I thought he uh, he might find it interesting. And then I thought, hey, let me see if he wants to to chime in on us discussing this video. And sure enough, he wanted to. So we're all here to have some fun. Um, the plan is I'm going to hit play. We'll let it play for a, basically make a statement or maybe two so we can dissect it but not do too much. It looks like it's four minutes and 40 seconds. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll just see how it goes. So let me go ahead and start it off here. Oh, wow, it's amazing. Sorry. Did you know that robotic process automation or RPA is simple but powerful when compared to traditional automation? Okay, first off, that yeah, it's simple and powerful. Whoop de do. Um, I was talking with Jackie Dim earlier. It says compared to traditional automation, and I think they explained it here in a minute. But it did make me wonder what in the world they meant by traditional automation. Um, let's go ahead and let it play, and let's see what they say, and then we can we'll stop it there. I shouldn't have jumped in. For a very long time, process automation has been the superhero for industries. As the technology has made huge transitions. RPA has replaced traditional automation techniques and has become the new approach for automating business. Let's now take a closer look at RPA and understand how it is different from traditional automation methods. In traditional automation, programming takes the key role while making use of APIs and other methods. Okay, so so that does, I guess, explain programming, which they didn't, this blob of text here doesn't really do it for me. But um, it is more about programming, right? I think that's what they're saying traditional automation is. Yeah, okay. So uh, from a, a coding perspective versus a, um, well, it, we'll get to that later. <laughs> but let, me, let me let it finish this slide and then we'll, we'll keep going. Okay. We'll, we'll pause again because maybe I still cut it off too early. But RPA comprehends the actions of a user at the user interface or UI level, which means the underlying technology and its application takes a back seat. RPA is simple and powerful and enables you with tools to create your own software robots to automate any business process. Your bots are configurable software set up to perform the tasks you assign and control. Think of them as your digital workforce. Show your bots what to do, then let them do the work. Huh. They can interact with any system or application the same way you do. All right, I'm going to stop here because I don't think they're going back to talking about traditional um, automation, you know, what, what they meant by it. 
but um boy they said a lot in that little bit there of like the the what do you guys want to comment on what they were saying i i heard what they said and and it was kind of weird to for you to show them the bot what to do right um, because yeah you can say that you can record some actions that 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 might be a, a correct term but to me showing about what to do is 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 at least different from showing a, a colleague what to do that the, the steps needed needs to be much more precise um, if it is to be an optimal way of doing it at least uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, but um, the, the part that really um, gives me a chafe, if you will, is the statement that you don't have to worry about the underlying technology and its application. And I'm going to harp for a minute on um, the two biggest ERPs in business, which is Oracle's EBS platform or SAP. Automation Anywhere does not interact with either one of them. <laughs> um, you end up having to do uh, some version of uh, coordinate based mouse clicks and sending text or image recognition. Um, even their advanced metabots do not interact well with those applications. So, um, and, and I have uh, personally, mind you, uh, escalated within Automation Anywhere's uh, corporate support, uh, trying to uh, debunk that last statement that it doesn't work with them. Um, and their answer was, it's not supported yet. And, uh, and I'm quoting Automation Anywhere on that. So I, I had the same thing of um, the, they, they talk about it in the traditional way, because I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think they, I heard them saying APIs, right? Mm -hmm. And I know Jackie and I have beat this to death of like when we talk about using an auto hotkey, we have two extremes. There's the one extreme of usually we start off with either COM or an API or something like that. And the other extreme is, you know, looking for mouse, sending mouse clicks and you looking for images and reacting to it. And like, but every time, if we can actually programmatically connect with something, damn straight, that's the route I'm going to go, right? It's much more, more faster, reliable, um, easier to, for me to program, um, consistent. There's so many benefits to it. Um, the other way, it can work and it can work okay, but it sure isn't, I, I don't view that as a benefit, um, you know, not having an API. Yeah, there is one more statement here that really bothers me. Um, now, I will be the first to admit I'm probably the exception to this state with this statement and not the norm. Uh, but the the I the statement that they made uh, about it being faster to deploy with uh, uh, automation anywhere than with code, I have a side by side comparison. Um, of me automating a web page with uh, Automation Anywhere and uh, by comparison with uh, AutoHotKey and the development time was virtually the same. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, for, for me, I think it would highly depend on the actual pages you're connecting to, but um, it, it's, on a lot of things, it's it's super easy with Auto Hotkey um, as long as I can use IE with it. But one I did anyway. I, there, there are times where I'm like, well, screw it. I'll just use a, an image thing like they're talking or something you're talking about. I'm I'm glad that you just brought up the whole IE thing because Automation Anywhere claims to support Chrome, mm. but it doesn't work <laughs> most of the time. Wow. That's interesting, especially because uh, we even with AutoHotKey, that's it's one of Jackie and mine's big biggest things for years. We've talked about it. It's like we love that IE you can enter, do everything you want with it, but we're concerned because of course IE is going away. 
Um, and then Geek Dude made his Chrome class, and, and at least that's a start in the right direction of being able to automate Chrome. I don't think it's as robust as IE, but there's a lot you can do with it. Um, and it does seem overall pretty consistent. Granted, and I haven't yep. used it that much. All right, let's get let's get this thing going a little more here. Bots can learn. Oh yeah, they can learn. They can also be cloned. See how they are working and adjust and scale as you see fit. Okay, I'm going to pause it there for a second because I I do the cloning side I get. That's great, right? You know anything any pro that I, I have no beef with that. But the learning side, um, Charlie, maybe you can talk some about that. But like, how many of them actually really do learn? I I know there's one with the image detection of like where things are. I've seen one with that. So uh, Automation Anywhere has a product called IQ Bots. It is separate. It is a separate license from the um, um, bot creator and um, runner. Uh, and its exclusive niche is being able to parse um, uh, unstructured data mm -hmm. um, based on uh, uh, being able to identify layouts. Um, it, it's not bad, but you, there is a uh, training, if you will, uh, period for it. Um, so, it, but you need, you need a lot of examples. Uh, and when I say a lot, I mean thousands uh, to get it to work well. Um, the, the other side of that, the bot creators, uh, the typical bot creator, is, which is the product that uh, Automation Anywhere drives, uh, there, there's no learning component to that. That's static um, application development. Uh, so I, I, I don't know why they're making that statement at all um, without referencing IQ bots. I, I, <clears throat> without knowing much about Automation Anywhere, just the claim of the bots can be cloned is to me, if it's a piece of software, um, it doesn't, it, why even claim that? It, it's code. It, it, if you made it into a single process, that could also just be run multiple. I, I don't see it as a real selling point that a bot can be cloned. It's, it's kind of a given if it's software, you can of course, either run it multiple times or copy the code or copy the top steps I, I wouldn't or run it on how to. systems right separately entirely um you know oh. i think would be hilarious um and i know uh, uh charlie's gonna laugh at this is if we went through this video and threw in like the dollar signs like when they actually mentioned stuff of like how much the things really cost um that would be hilarious because Oh, oh, maybe it's a little. It's a, oh, yeah, a little, little more for the. No, it's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? Five thousand dollars for each clone. Man, human clones are cheaper. Yearly. <laughs> Yearly, yeah. All right, and I, I, this, I can see this gray part here. It was coming up here. Let's. It's code free. Okay, I'm gonna stop there because I know. <laughs> Charlie, I, we I, we had two takeaways from this. Charlie, why don't you do head and yours? It says they're like, it's code free. So Charlie, why don't you say something uh, about that? Code free, <laughs> if, if only. Um, so just like every programming language uh, in the history of uh, computers, uh, you have your three basic programming structures, statements, conditions, and loops. Um, and the uh, the thing is, uh, it you do program it just like uh, any application. Uh, now you drag a programming statement to the screen, but then you have to fill out a GUI for each component. So if you drag an if statement to the screen, you still have to plug in both sides of an operand. Yeah, they're giving you the structure kind of thing, but not. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's uh, maybe easier, but it's still programming in every sense of the word. It's not code free by any stretch of the imagination. And um, it, I, I was I was almost uh, uh, 
half about to uh, open up my my own automation anywhere and um, show us some stuff. I, I, I was like, I, I heard it's code free, and then you explained it, Tank, and and I'm, I I was sitting there and thinking, oh, but maybe they're talking about you don't need to learn a syntax and stuff. But even if you just need to learn to read how it's structured, you're actually learning a very simple type of syntax. That's so, so yeah, claiming so, something is code free when that. Yeah. And my, my takeaway was code free isn't necessarily good, right? Like I, I go out of my way when I find like a tool I'm using that I can actually use syntax instead of the GUI for doing all the stuff. Like I'll use because I can copy that and swap out things very quickly and, and go much faster than if I'm using the GUI to do it because it just takes forever. Um, I, I don't. I I think they should have stressed both. You know, you, hey, you know, it's you can you, you have a GUI if you want it kind of thing. I would have viewed that as a positive, but hopefully, which I know from talking to Tank though, at least I, I think it was automation anywhere. At times, you can't use something that you'd want to use. Like if let's say you had a little auto hotkey tool that could get around something that auto machine where can't do, you can't just easily connect to it and use some code. Is that right, Charlie? Um, so there is the ability to uh, plug in and uh, use uh, VB uh, oh, okay. script. Um, and, and also you could, you could get away with, uh, although I've never done it, uh, you could get away with executing some um, auto hotkey uh, but, um, the, uh, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm clicking and talking at the same time, but the, the, um, there are a lot of cases where you have to enhance automation anywhere with code. Um, Everything from custom DLLs to interact with uh, Google Docs applications to, uh, and this is Automation Anywhere's uh, recommendation. They even have a tutorial on how to build such a DLL uh, with C Sharp. Uh, but that's not programming, so that that's fine. But that's not programming, so that's fine. So, okay, so I have my Automation Anywhere screen up. Um, and if if we don't mind, I'll I'll just share the absurdity of no code. Okay, I'll I'll stop share for a second. All right. So so here's the absurdity of no code. We have variable operations. We have this looping structure here. Um, so I still have to understand the concept of allocating memory with a variable. I still have to understand wow. uh, what a loop is. And this is sample code that comes with uh, automation anywhere. So I, I didn't write this. I, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't build this for the sake of uh, uh, making something difficult. But that is uh, so ironic, right? The, the example code you're showing for, for the thing that doesn't have code. Yeah, that's that's. All. Does does this look simple to anyone? Well, it's it's somewhat readable, but yeah, obviously there's a lot of lot of stuff going on there. I'd say you you'd still need to use a good amount of time on actually learning just the syntax of how it does this, just to, of course, keystrokes. Yeah, that makes sense. But how's that much different from the keyword send? or whatever it might be, right? It, to me, it, it looks just like normal code. Yeah, um, it looks exactly like uh, every dozen uh, coding softwares I've, I've ever worked with. Uh, so I, I really despise the, the no code statement. I really, uh, uh, it's, it, it's personal opinion, of course. Uh, you know what but, it is though, it gets back to, they are trying to they're trying to hook you right so they're like yeah. oh don't worry don't worry about it. there's nothing nothing to see here right it'll be easy trust me um and then of course you get you get interested and you contact them and over time they whip away that little thing behind the window oh crap though well, there is now oh, that looks like code. no that's not code no, we don't that's not code right right all right let, yeah. let's uh 
Let me get back to the video here. <laughs> Non-disruptive, non-invasive, and easy. Okay, so this is non-disruptive, non. What was it? Invasive, invasive. invasive. Yeah. and easy. Hmm. Um, I guess that the easy part is probably there. There is a record button, and, and you can do some actions, and that's what they claim as being the easy one. Uh -huh. But non-disruptive and non-invasive. What, what does that even? tell me I'm, I'm, if, I, I get that if you inject something in another process you're kind of invasive but other than that what what coding practice is really invasive that does I was guessing they were referring to something as if someone was using the computer um, but that shouldn't be what they're thinking right because I know from talking to tank usually it's run on its own server or you know right so that can't be what they're referring to right yeah so go ahead yeah 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 i i know from the little piece of uh, rpa i've seen at my company we we have hired another company to do everything and then it's just run for us and i understand why my company did it uh, even if i'm not really um on board with it but hey they did it to not have anybody in house do it. But to me, when I saw that everything was just run on a remote, fully functional Windows uh, virtual machine somewhere, I was like, oh, then everything can be done in this way if we just have virtuals, virtual machines doing it. That, that doesn't even seem like, oh, yeah. So to me, that, that was an eye opener. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, non-invasive. Uh, they they push the idea of running on a separate system. Uh, now, automation anywhere, uh, in fairness, does support hotkeys and uh, desktop triggers, uh, but it's so expensive to license it per desktop that no one does it. Um, so uh, the, the about the only way anyone ever runs automation anywhere is is on a remote server, uh, virtual machines, just like what Jackie was describing. Um, the the what was the other thing they said? Non-invasive and non-disruptive. Oh, non-disruptive. Non yeah. 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 Um, so uh, the whole. There, there have been two driving forces for RPA, the, the big arguments for it uh, over the uh, few years that it's been a term. Uh, and, and the first one was uh, uh, redu reduction of staff. Uh, I'd say that's pretty disruptive. Um, yeah. and, and now everybody's saying, well, uh, you're reallocating staff and using them for their brain power. Well, if we change business processes uh, as a byproduct of implementing RPA, I would say that's fairly disruptive. Um, and, and I have never, um, in the three years that I have implemented automation anywhere, not seen major disruption from the implementation. It's kind of the point, right? I mean, <laughs> the, the, the other thing um, I was thinking of, and maybe it's more along the lines of the intrusiveness, and, and a, I think this is accurate, um, and it's for auto hotkey as any, anything that's like RPA related, is you're not, and I, I, you're not correct connecting, you're connecting at the surface level. You're not connecting programmatically and that can really, you know, monkey things up. You're doing things that a human could do, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that I, if that's what they meant by the intrusiveness kind of thing, I, I could see that, right? Okay, that, that's a fair statement. Um, and, and one I, I don't uh, purport to argue with, uh, except that one of the, uh, one of the recommended, uh, can I share my screen again? One of the uh, recommended uh, approaches um, 
for interacting uh, with a and getting a data source is is to use uh, a connection to an actual SQL database, um, SQL statements. Um, that's not programming, no. No, um, no, no. Uh, then there is uh, the uh, app integration, um, Unix shells, Windows, uh, DOS commands. The, these aren't. These aren't uh, surface automation tasks uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and um, what was the other one that just really, uh, terminal emulators, they, it comes with its own terminal emulator uh, for terminal automation uh, mainframes uh, for the, the sole sake of the fact that it can't interact with your own licensed terminal emulator. Um, XML, um, they do, there's a great deal of reliance within every automation job I've done on uh, XML. And um, again, not, not surface automation by any stretch of the imagination and Let's not finally forget SOAP or yeah. interact. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, what's the other one that I was going to go after? Uh, the Excel automation. Uh, I'm not going to harp on too bad because it's almost surface automation, uh, but but not quite. Um, oh, the email. That was the one. Okay, so email automation. Um, turns out to be a, a big talking point every time uh, we, we talk about selling and, and implementing uh, automation anywhere. It's um, everybody gets, you know, an order or uh, an update to an application through email and and uh, automation anywhere comes in and says, OK, well, we can automate, you know, the opening of your email and reading your attachments um, and doing whatever. And and that statement is true, except that it doesn't use the email client at all. And it marks all of your messages as read. Oh. You know, it's, it's one of the things I've, Jack and I have talked about a lot. And it was one of the things I loved about IE and of course Outlook and Excel too, is I can literally be doing something in either Outlook or IE or whatever, and then hit a hotkey or do whatever and auto hotkey will connect to that instance. And so it's awesome because I have total control on connecting with something I'm doing, which is something that for me, I love, right? It's not, different entire like you said your email it's not even in your email um how do you know what did what happened what didn't happen I and mean, it starts getting really confusing yeah yeah um so not not surface automation at all and in fact uh to to use it you have to plug in your email server port username password um it, it's like configuring any email client just to use it yeah cool all right, let's get back to the video here. Compared to traditional, we know none of us actually mentioned the whole easy. Right? <laughs> that's the other one I know from. I know because because Tank's mentioned this. They, you know, they the the, the general plan. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tank, is that um, they they have people like you go out and install systems. Um, your your software and configure things, and then you're training someone there, right? On, that's usually part of their staff to be able to tweak stuff. But even that person, and this is where it's like, more often than not, they actually can't do any anything really. They can they can maybe if something breaks, maybe they can fix it, you know. And so uh, this setting got changed, but they're not creating their own. Is that right? Most of the time, not. Um, and uh, another. Another contradiction to that statement is uh, the consultants that we 
these companies hire uh, to uh, to do these implementations uh, run about two thousand dollars a day. Um, if it's so easy, why are we paying so much to implement it? Um, and, and there's a shortage of people who know how to use it, who, who know how to implement with, with uh, Automation Anywhere, UiPath, or Blue Prism for that matter. Um, so if it's so easy, why is it so hard to find people who can implement it and why is it so expensive? No, that's a great one. All right, let's, uh, I, actually this next one popped on the screen. It can plug and play with all app all applications and systems, current and legacy. I don't even know what to say on that, right? Because that's a bold statement. Yeah, that, that that's a, a really bold statement. And and it is, um, I don't know, I, I can't support plug and play, but the ability to interact with any application, sure. Because at the end of the day, uh, I can always interact with an application with a uh, keystroke or a mouse click. Um, which I can do with automation anywhere, but it's not reliable. <laughs> no, and that's that's kind of why the uh, that's what they're trying to to get across by saying it's plug and play with all applications and systems, right? It, it's like mm, this: you just plug it in, and then it plays, and it's reliable. They didn't use that word, but that's kind of what they're implying by yeah. putting it there. All right, let me hit play again. Traditional automation techniques, RPA takes a fraction of the time while being able to execute in any environment and across any application anywhere. Okay, they, they, they and that's another one. I'm like, I believe it can be true. You know, any sort of RPA can, can take a quote unquote fraction of the time as a human doing it, right? If it's a one-on-one, -on -one, generally speaking, you should be able to, at a bare minimum, match what a human's doing. Um, but sometimes it's not that, the actual time being done, the, the difference is that they can work around the clock, right? Um, and you can, of course, clone them and have multiple of them. Yeah, uh, I, the, the other thing I would add to that is I, I've seen a lot of uh, Automation Anywhere implementations um, that really, uh, were performance wise comparable to a human operator uh, rather than radically faster. Uh, but the, the, just like you said, the, the benefit is they can work around the clock, never take breaks and, and uh, uh, be cloned easily scaled up or down uh, if you want to pay the license fees. You know, it's one of the things that really annoys me. They say, it can take a fraction of the time. So 99.9%, .9%, well, that's a fraction. So they're right. honest, right? Um, there, there really should be some sort of rule of thumb of like, it has to be less than half or something, right? If you, you make that statement. Yeah, I, I know from, from my company where one of the things was, yeah, it's, it's so useful. Uh, every morning when we uh, come into work, uh, the report is just there uh, or whatever it is. Yeah. Yep. And, and yeah, that's great because, hey, it doesn't really have work hours. So they started at 10 p.m. last night and it used eight hours on doing it and, and had it ready for you at six o'clock this morning. That's, that's nice. But was it really faster? No, it's just working at another time frame than what a human would have done. So, so to me, it wasn't really that, wow. Uh, if you have asked someone to do it yesterday, then they could probably have had it ready for you as well. Yeah. yeah now, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw out there playing uh, a little bit of devil's advocate. I, I know that we're harping on automation anywhere, uh, but the the flip side to this is um, it is cheaper than outsourcing at the end of the day. So um, shipping off your, your workload to India. Yep. Uh, so th there is there is a good side to this as well. Absolutely. In that, um, you know, we, we had, to, I think Jackie and I covered that one of them. We were talking about that uh, robotic process automation 
um, book. Which one was it? I'm looking at one, but I don't think it was that. Anyway, and they talked about the pricing for outsourcing. It used to be like, uh, you know, outsourcing to the UK, not UK, sorry, um, like Asia type things. I think it was like the average in the US was 65,000 a year. The UK was like 35, something like that. And then like an RPA solution was like 10 or, or somewhere in there, right? And that's using yeah. one of these tools, right? Imagine if you're using AutoHotKey, right? It's, it's so much less. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's and, and to be fair, to, at least for me, I want to be an, I'm just trying to do an accurate, you know, uh, evaluation of this video. Not, I'm not necessarily trying to pick on them. Yeah. No, we it all, just, we love yeah. it, right? We love the, 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 the industry. Um, it just seemed like there was a bunch of like, wow, did they really say a lot? Um, I also found it very interesting of what they believe are the, the, the high points to stress to people that might be interested in buying. So that was one of the things I found interesting about of what, what are they stressing? That's stuff that we should think about. This is things that we should convey if we actually want to work in this area, right, and get business. I'd say the first time I've, I viewed it, I did view it as an ad, not necessarily an ad for automation anywhere, just uh, generally an ad for the type of automation that we do yeah. uh, without a hotkey or with any other type of thing that is interacting at this uh, user level uh, so so it's it's not bad in that aspect but yeah when when they do claim stuff that is kind of um untrue or uh, misleading or whatever you'd say where here they're trying to sell their way of automating stuff contra other ways of automating stuff and of course all of us here have automated stuff using auto hotkey and that's why we are kind of um claiming some of this stuff to be over exaggerated yeah yeah and 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 uh, and, and that's all we're really saying is there's some some exaggeration to these statements yeah all right let's let's keep going rpa bots can start immediately scale on demand wait 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 wait, wait, wait. wait a minute RPA bots can start immediately um, unless they've already been, I mean, how long tank, if you go in when you were using this, because someone says, Hey, we want to hire you to automate this process, right? From that day where they say, Hey, we got a job, go out. When do you, and I know you're much more efficient than most, right? But, but at a bare minimum on average, what would you say that that late the time is before you have something even a prototype where you're actually starting to say, like, let's get it going. Uh, I, I, I would say the, the uh, MVP of whatever was asked for, the, the minimum viable product, uh, typically gets deployed from, from start of, hey, I got an idea to something running in production uh, about three months on average. That's, that's immediately, though. That's, yeah. Sorry, it just, it just made me laugh. And here, keep working 100%. Yeah, okay, that's true, right? They can, yep, that, that's absolutely true. And you can, and I'm sure the next one, if they don't, is going to talk about the scalability, right? Um, let, let's let it go here. At 100% capacity nonstop. Add cognitive automation, and your digital workforce can handle even complex unstructured information to automate any business process from end to end. That, that's where we should have thrown up eight million more dollar signs, right? Add cognitive automation, throwing up tons of dollar signs. Mm -hmm. Now that we understand what RPA is and how it is different from traditional automation methods, let's understand the business benefits of Automation Anywhere's RPA tool. Automation Anywhere Enterprise empowers the workforce for the future as it is powerful and intuitive secure and scalable, intelligent and connected, open and integrated. Either you have something to say on that? I'm, I don't know enough about it to really comment. Um, all right. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to go around the circle there real quick. Uh, powerful and intuitive. If you have uh, any, any scripting background, uh, that statement is true. Um, it, is, it is fairly easy for someone with some script, some scripting background 
uh, to figure out how to, how to build something. Uh, secure and scalable. In particular, I would say Automation Anywhere does this better. Uh, than, than most. Um, we, we don't store credentials within the code. Um, there, it does have a, a secure server that uh, pulls variables at runtime uh, uh, from the server for, for that. Uh, and the permissions to even get to that are, can be separated from uh, those who have the ability to create and deploy bots. Uh, so I would, I would give them a lot of credit on that statement. Um, intelligent and connected. So the deployment of uh, Automation Anywhere is um, server to client. Uh, yeah, they're connected. Um, uh, I don't know how I feel about the statement of intelligent. I'm just gonna leave it alone. <laughs> Open and integrated. Open? No, it's very closed source. Um, and integrated, you know, for anything except the big ERPs um, and uh, a few other caveats like uh, any screen with a data grid, all automation has trouble with. Uh, uh, Citrix implementations, whatever. Uh, aside from that, it, it does it does tie in fairly well most of the time. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll say that that's mostly true. Cool. Jim and Jackie, you're good. Yeah, I, I would have said some of the same things from my uh, very narrow knowledge of this, uh, where. It would, think has uh, first-hand experience with automation anywhere so yeah um I'll, I'll try to make a note of this but i think it <coughs> might be a fun conversation the the stuff that the tank was mentioning about how it can save some of the, the the credentials and passwords on different place and in i think a fun topic for a further um, not this one, but another podcast would be, can, can we do something at all similar to that for auto hotkey, right? Cause that's one of the things, the big critics critiques about auto hotkey, right? Is that it, it, for the most part, it's, it's very, um, it's just, uh, it's just, everything's out there, right? It's very hard to lock down like that. All right. I'd say you, you could do some of the same stuff with the secure server and stuff like that, but you'd still have some issues at runtime and, and whatnot. I, I, I don't know enough about the, the true back end of our hotkey to know how, how stuff would be handled there. Uh, I would say with modification, yes. Um, but that is the beauty of auto hotkey is that anyone's free to modify it a little bit. Yeah. All right. Let's get moving forward. The following are some of the business benefits of Enterprise RPA. Increase business process speed. Bots execute at the fastest possible pace, never slowing down or taking breaks. Scale. We already kind of addressed that. Um, I mean, it's it's overall true, right? It, but it, it does make it sound like it's uh, it's going to be insanely fast. Yeah. Yeah, you know, to to me here here it it probably wouldn't compare to traditional automation as they call it, where where you actually go in and dissect the two this this separate parts of the process, and maybe send everything um, through an API, uh, where where here so increased business process speed, that that really does depend on what the process is. You know, Jackie, to, to, to comment on that, um, when I was at TI and I, and I worked in internet marketing and at first, you know, I had this job, I was um, working for the, the, the email database team and I had, to, I had to take my list of email addresses and, and as a file and, and load them into our vendor tool and tag them and do all the stuff. And manually, it took me, if I remember right, seven and a half minutes, somewhere in that eight minutes, um, I, I was teaching myself how to automate. And that's where 
Jackie, um, you, you especially, uh, Tank, actually I saw you, you answered one or two of my questions too at the time. This is years and years ago, right? But with web scraping, I automated the web scraping and I got it down to where I want to say it was a minute and a half we're using web scraping. So it wasn't waiting for a human. I didn't have to watch it and wait for check for things, right? It plugged along. So greatly increased the speed because I didn't have to focus on it. And then after like a year, I learned our vendor had an API and I started playing with API tools. And I got that thing down to about two seconds where I'd hit a button. And it, of course it was still running, but I didn't have to do anything. And it took total like 15 seconds to do it. But it was, it was lightning I mean, so fast using the API over web scraping. So I think you're right. It, it differs on depending on what you're doing. All right, let's keep going. Capacity on demand. RPA is infinitely elastic and increases or decreases bandwidth in real time with bots dollars, at your dollars, service. Dollars, dollars. Improve auditability. Everything that RPA bots do is monitored and recorded. Uh, I, I, amen, right? That That's a, an absolute great point that, that you can have. Um, so... Audit trails. Go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, I I was just going to mention that I know that you have said before that they do this um, to to at least uh, a, a fair extent, uh, and that is something that companies might ask for. Where we're doing it, let's say, with auto hotkey, if uh, if you had built uh, um, uh, something that would record your script's actions beforehand you wouldn't need to use as much time on it every time but to me that that would take a good amount of development to to make it do that so so having implemented uh, a fair amount of logging in my uh, automation career within banking uh, it's uh, it, it's not it's not terribly difficult uh, from a coding perspective um, the audit trail that is automatically generated with automation anywhere um, has the data points of uh, start time, run time, uh, machine name. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, is there anything about the program, the, the window or anything that you interacted with? No, uh, it will, it does log uh, um, if there's a, a fault where the script, uh, where, where the bot runs into a failure and actually crashes. Um, but that's it. You, you still have to code in uh, some form of logging just like you do with scripts. Uh, if, you, if you truly want uh, to know who did what, who 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 uh, updated a record, or you know which particular bot implementation did, you, you'd still have to implement some logging in uh, from a code perspective. Well, I'm going to have to correct you there because there's no coding involved, Tank. Um, oh, that's please. right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go a little more. Enhanced security. RPA enables unprecedented security with separation of duties, access control, and ironclad encryption and architecture. And you want to, either of you guys chime in on that? I, I don't know anything about it. So, go ahead, Jackie. No, but I, I, I was just going to speak because nobody else did. So, so I don't really have anything truly clever to say. So just say what you need to say. All right. So separation of duties. Uh, this is this is really a governance subject for any IT um, department. They they want to separate the developers from the uh, production teams, uh, and and so this this it's true um, because each. Uh, each implementation, uh, whether it's in a dev environment to a, or a production environment, is is completely separate. They're they're totally separate. Their credentials are separate, um, and and so that's that's uh, and they have a good code migration from from environment to environment. Um, there the 
uh, security is is pretty darn good. I, I again, I'm on the security subject. I give Automation Anywhere a lot of credit. Cool. That's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. We'll get going. Maximize accuracy. RPA can achieve error-free execution. That's 100% accuracy every time. Deliver business intelligence. It can also be 100% wrong, right? But, but yeah, but over time, you can... Yeah. It, it can achieve 100% accuracy. They say it themselves. So, so if your implementation is 100% correct, it will probably do it 100% correct. So, yeah. You know what that reminds me of? I don't know if you, you guys watched the BBC version of The Office, but there was the, the one guy, the really dorky guy, and he's on the phone with the people that made the calculator. And he's calling him because he thinks there's a fault. And he's like, well, two plus eight, what's that? Oh, it's 10. Oh, it's right this time. Um, and, he, and he kept trying to like do numbers and like supposedly it was going to be wrong. Um, you're like, it's, it's a calculator. Um, I'm pretty sure that you got that locked down where it's not going to be wrong. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, you program something right, it's going to be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it does exactly what you tell it to do. Yeah. Yeah. Unlike humans, which I, I'll give them that. <laughs> RPA analytics transform the details that bots report back in real time into performance and operational insights. Ooh. Let me see if there's more right there. Oh, okay. Um. Now that one to me. Ah. Uh, oh, did we lost Charlie. Um. Uh, it, it um i have to believe that's not actually accurate without a lot of work being done to understand and interpret what the data is that gets captured means does that make sense i mean like i might i spent my life in metrics <laughs> um, yeah, i'm like if if we take it on that it isn't logging a lot um what business intelligence is it providing do do you get what I'm saying? If absolutely, if, yeah, uh, they might have a uh, something that will tell you how much the bot ran and how much time it saved and how much whatever. But it if it isn't delivering any type of extra business intelligence about the task that it's performing, I don't see how it's doing that. That simp <laughs> yeah. simply has to be. Um has to do with um you know reporting type of things right being able to analyze but again that's not something that's automatic right someone has to go in and lay out exactly what this does and compare this and that which is great no i'm not knocking it but they make it sound like it's all automatic right and and this is like that i know that's it's you know your data yeah at least you have clean data that's structured but until you really decide to say what our metrics are what we're trying to achieve it's that there's no way that this can be automated um it's nice they have it built in there, I suppose. I'd say you, you could probably make a bot that would go in and fetch all kind of matrices that you could use yeah. for your business intelligence. But other than that, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Which is one of the things I used, you know, um, auto hockey for is to go in and to grab data in order to, to, to start doing some analysis or, or even just reporting or whatever, right? It's, um, it's better than doing it manually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there is a, a, a product within Automation Anywhere called um, Business Analytics, and, and it's, it's part of the default um, installation. Uh, now, it doesn't it doesn't create more data than, than the things I've already talked about, but, but it does, um, uh, like, like it, it doesn't record even how much, how many records were processed, uh, because it has no way of knowing, uh, from a generic bot standpoint. Um, so, uh, they, they push the idea a lot of, of business analytics, but it, it's really not, not all that helpful, except for uh, maybe uh, for part of the information necessary to calculate ROI. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, hit play. Maximize availability. Bots don't sleep. RPA is designed to run nonstop, 
Just say go. What um what what in the world is oh twenty four meaning twenty four hours in a day? Okay, I'm like, why are they multiplying this? They're gonna have twenty four bots? No, I, okay. Um, which of course it's a no brainer, right? Yeah, you can run them whenever you want. Right. What they don't mention, and I know for me, and I think this is for many of the top leading things, is and I know Charlie, we've talked about this, is that each bot you know costs you you know whatever amount of dollars, right? So it's a big dollar figure, and then if you want to have one on your uh, the different environments, right? You buy one for each license for those. And if you want to have a second one to run, that's another license you have to buy, right? I mean, it's, yeah, you can maximize the ability and have them running, but you can't, and this is what, for me, the way auto hotkey works, of course, I can have one script that does multiple different things. Um, the way they have it, this, like you think of it more like a person and I can work on this or I can, I can use the same bot and I can do that, but I can't do both at the same time. Is that correct, Charlie? Yeah, uh, so with Auto Hotkey, we could um, thread out multiple um, interactions to happen simultaneously uh, in the background of the desktop. Uh, automation anywhere is single thread, period. Um, it is clicking here only or not at all. I mean, Interesting. Okay. All right. Let's go. Optimized yeah, labor is, is maximized uh, availability. Is that really a selling point? To to me, when thinking about it, uh, yeah. why is this different than any other type of code or automation or macro setup or script or whatever? Um, do do we really need to have a maximized availability. Um, to to me, it's like, yeah, it, it's it's sad that people they go they come in at eight and and go home at four or whatever, and and then you can't reach them on the phone. But after that, isn't that availability? The the rest is, or are they talking about the, another type of availability here, or what? I'm just like, do, do I really need to have the bot available at midnight? I, I know it's running. They they already told me that earlier, but yeah. Yeah, so there are some um, overlapping points being made for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get your point, Jack. And I, and I think that's what you're, you're right, Tank. It's just, it's, did it have to be a separate point? It's, yeah, it's not a strong, like, wow. When, when overall the concept is is a, an important one, but I think they could have had that in, tied together with some of the other stuff. FDA handles a competitive business concept. They can keep participating in what adds value. Improved business process compliance. Following the rules is one of the defining traits of RPA. Um, okay, the, the optimized labor investment. Sure, I guess it, that, that, which, that part of that you're talking about tank um hey we can stop hiring people for this and and use them more into it or, or uh, intelligently um the next one the improved business compliance i love that right uh, absolutely you can again you can do it back to the mac maximize accuracy of 100 percent. it'll do what we tell it to do and it'll do x y and z and we always want it to do that and they'll do it where humans don't right so i get that yeah um so the other side, uh, the other point to think about with that, I think, is um, how many how many large businesses have we seen with multiple offices, and in each office they do the same job differently. Oh yeah. Um, oh, hey, even and, on the same team, they do things differently, right? Working in the same building. Right. So, so it is it is a strong point to. Uh, improve compliance both with process guidelines and and even regulatory uh compliance standards yeah but yeah here it, it's still just an extra point uh, with the dollars that you talked about joe right they yeah. i i loved this when just viewing it as someone automating a task for someone it, it's some great selling points it really is but maximizing accuracy and improve business process compliance, those two are just 
two sides of the same coin, right? Because if you make an accurate, uh, an, an accurate version of this process, you will of course make it so it complies with your business process guidelines, or you should. Yeah, yeah, if you don't, you're a fool, right? Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and keep going. Improve controls. Once set up to follow standards and regulations, bots will never deviate from the assigned execution path. What, what the hell? Like, isn't that what we just talked about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Improve employee morale. RPA relieves the burden of manual repetitive processes, giving your workforce the opportunity to achieve great things. Yeah, and, and we know this is... This is somewhat true, right? Um, now those people, when it does re replace them and they no longer have a job, I'm not too sure how happy those people are. But um, I, I know I'm happier when I'm actually doing stuff that gets me to use my brain instead of doing something mundane. So I'll agree with at least that logic. I, I, I know from firsthand a story told by, by a colleague for me at, at a go home meeting or whatever you call those. And <clears throat> it, it was fine. They had a process that took them mm, combined maybe a day or three or something because when were people available and when did they had time to to hand over their part of the process and there was a good amount of legwork because people were kind of carrying uh, what their parts uh, to someone else and they continued on. And I don't know the entire process, but they had one of these RPA bots made for the process and, and it was able to do it um, in a night. So let's just say used five hours or something on it because there was a lot of waiting on the system to respond. So it wasn't because the bot was slow or anything else, but the system it was interacting with was slow in generating the, the numbers needed and the reports and stuff like that. So, but to me, they were so happy they didn't have to do it anymore because now the bot was doing it. And, and for that one thing, these three employees were kind of happy they didn't have to use those three hours uh, every month or whatever it was on that task. But that's just one task. That's where, oh, nice, I don't have to do that one task. And then it becomes two tasks, three tasks, and four tasks. And, and all of a sudden, uh, an entire week's worth of a month is taken away from their desk. And it's just meant to free up their mental capacity to do other stuff. And uh, it, that just can't continue right yeah. well so i'm i'm <clears throat> i'm reminded of a couple of points um to think about here uh the first is um spreadsheets was the first um uh, killer app um it was it was supposed to destroy accountants forever we have more accountants than ever before um the, the reality is um, for RPA to work, uh, you, need, you need staff in place, uh, just bot operators, some say bot pilots. Uh, much more fulfilling and, and happy job. And then the, the third point I, I wanna make about that is um, I've never walked into a place where the so-called drones of the company uh, didn't have a lot of thoughts about ways to do things better, but didn't have a way. Um, and, and that's commonly referred to as tribal knowledge. Uh, you know, the, the undocumented, uncharted knowledge of, of the underlying business, the, the things that no one else knows, not, even, not the CEO, certainly not the executives, um, uh, and, and I'm reminded of what would have happened if Amazon had never moved past books. So a smart company is going to take these 
improved freed up staff um, and designate them towards uh, innovation. Uh, so uh, that, that certainly is going to improve morale. Uh, hey, I'm, I'm now more valuable than ever. <laughs> Um, a company like the one that I'm working on, uh, at, we don't have much, um, um, there, there's not many temporary positions. There's not much freelancing going on. It's, it's mostly people hired for uh, indefinitely, so to speak. And of course, people find other jobs and move to that. And so there's not much firing going on unless people are really stupid or whatever and when when taking that into account we have a, a finite amount of customers contra the things that we're doing we're let's just take what i'm doing specifically providing heating for the uh, the homes in copenhagen and there's no more homes to provide heating for than the ones that we have because everybody is um, forced to get heating from us. So the only thing that can happen is they decide to both pay to be connected to our network and then deciding to use something else as well. So we can only lose a few customers, but we won't be able to get more. So the amount of money coming in is finite. So let's say that we somehow use a staggering amount of getting stuff processed uh, automated. And we, we can't just turn everybody into innovators because what are we really hoping to have them innovate on? Um, if most of the stuff that we are currently doing is automated. And, and I'm not saying it to, to kind of knock on automation or anything. I, I just want uh, the general idea of people knowing that automation can mean that there's going to be some kind of shift in what types of jobs will be there and how many people are needed to do office type jobs like the ones that I'm currently seeing. So, um, I hear what you're saying, uh, and, and I imagine that there are other really finite um, situations out there, I, I, but I also imagine that those are uh, relatively to the grand scheme of all business, uh, uh, a minority. Um, that being said, the, the other aspect here that, that I, I mentioned that cannot be overlooked uh, is the fact that you need people to handle the bots, um, and, and you do. So as it turns out, uh, the statistic to be, to be shared, and, and I, have, I have seen this not just with implementations that I have been on, but uh, uh, large, uh, large organizations that, that have a lot of bots, <laughs> turns out, that the number is uh, between seven and nine bots per uh, per um, developer. Um, that's about all you can support and develop uh, until you are maxed out. <coughs> uh, so if you have if you have ninety bots, you absolutely have at least nine full time high paid. Uh, developers on staff. Uh, I agree, Charlie, but, but I think we already discussed this earlier. Those nine high paid, you know, bot developers, chances of them actually being a current employee, someone that had learned how to do this, that used to, used to then a current employee, right, that used to do the things like is pretty rare, right? It's, it's so, so I, just back to what happens to them. I agree overall on average, we end up the, as a country, even, or as a company, we end up with having higher paid positions, but that those specific employees don't necessarily, you know, some of them. And, and here's the thing, right? Which I agree with this. 
hey, I had a mundane job doing this. You know, it got, got outsourced because just because because and this has been going on forever, right? Look at any technology across the world and, and the history, right? And look at automotives, right? Technology comes in and it gets low enough. Look at the uh, what are the order things at McDonald's now, right? The kiosk things, right? It's ha- because say you know what you better learn how to do something than have a skill that's worth actually getting paid for. So hopefully when they, they lose a mundane job, they go, you know what? I need to get a skill that actually I can't be outsourced for. And, and I think then, then those people, my just point is it's not, they're not necessarily the same, that, that same company, right? But hopefully in the long run, they are happier because they, they end up making more money. Yeah, and, and I, I think the key here is continuous learning uh, yeah. throughout your career. Uh, now, that being said, the, the training for implementing and, and operating bots is getting better uh, over time. It is improving. Um, and, and eventually we'll get there where we can take people with uh, uh, average to high IQs and, and turn them into bot operators, even if they have no experience. Yeah. Um, so, so that day is coming. I agree. I agree. All right, let's keep going. Accelerate digital transformation. RPA extends your automation footprint and provides insights that can change the way you do business. Do, do they just make up some shit? Was <laughs> accelerate? No, it? no. Actually, this is this is one of the the things I said that was so disruptive uh, oh. is is that it does radically change the the business process uh, for the, for any remaining staff. Mm. Uh, that that is absolutely true. Okay. All right. Thank you for watching this video. Now you know about the difference between traditional automation and RPA. Yeah, no, I really don't. Please visit the Automation Anywhere documentation and training webpage for other video resources under the... All right, we'll assume it's stopped there. Anyway, um, yeah, this was a fun exercise. Um, again, we're, we're hammering them just because, you know, the, it, and again, it's a sales piece, right? So it's geared to push that the envelope of, of uh, that line of saying what we can do. They want to get the door knock, right? Um, there's no mention of money anywhere when you know, like to your point, um, Tank, you were saying, you know, just to, to have someone and it takes three months, right? So you're saying $2,000 a day for three months. Is that right? Am I... mm-hmm. okay. And that's not counting the license fees and stuff, right? That's just to have someone come on site and start, you know, developing the bot. And that's the minimum. Um, we're talking about some serious money. Um, yeah. The, the entry point is uh, quite high uh, financially, and, and that is why we, we typically only see it in Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and, and that gets back to, yeah, you do have to have, I mean, for that to make sense, boy, you really got to be, you got to have a, 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 either a huge, huge number of transactions that you're going to automate um, to help pay for that, right? Or because you're not going to be paying... I doubt you're on average outsourcing like um, lawyers, right? At least not yet. Awesome. Well, anyway, I thought that was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us, um, Tank. Yeah, absolutely. It was have fun. Some insights as uh, having actually worked with with them. And I know Jackie, you're you're doing some. Your company's doing automation. <laughs> I know you do it at work too, but uh, it's not official RPA just because um, they had to hire that out. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and mm, I think it's it's fine. They're they're kind of tipping their toes into it, yeah. and and I'm not really afraid that we'll lose many people just yet because a lot of the people who are supposed to get the ideas of what to automate um, haven't really they they don't have the the knowledge of what can be automated to really understand what to attack yet uh, where to me it's it's kind of like almost anything has some kind of uh, opportunity to be automated and and so so when i'm looking at my colleague across the room and and what the person does most is answer the phone type in some stuff and look at some stuff in another program and that's what's done throughout the day and um i'm i'm just i'm not saying that these process automation stuff is the the end stop all but when looking at seeing the google assistant or whatever it was if ordering a haircut or oh, right whatever it was yeah. a year ago or something yeah. 
and supplying that to the knowledge of all the rest of it and, and say, let's go four or five years out into the future, someone will have come to market with that kind of process power included in some of these systems. So with what I'm seeing at my company, something automatic like that could easily pick up the phone and look up the data that the person is asking for or type in what they're telling us into the other system. So that that entire thing that she is doing currently could be totally removed within um, three years. And that would come as kind of a shock to that position. She probably would be put on other tasks because that's not the only, only thing she's doing, but it would be a very short time frame for her to go in, out and reschool herself to doing something else. Because if someone does it well enough, why wouldn't everybody implement something like that? Mm -hmm. and, and that's where, to me, it, it, uh, when they talk about copying bots and stuff like that, where with a, a lot of robotic um, process automation, it's very task specific. But as soon as some kind of um, <laughs> bulk or whatever you would call it uh, of these bots or AI systems or whatever you would want to call them, if they get to a level where they can actually be shared between companies, then it, it could take off like, whoa. And I don't know if it will, because I'm like, I'm looking at our history and, and for everything up to now for 300,000 years, we've always found something new to do each time we figured something out. Oh, fire, let's make food on that. Oh, then 200,000 years later, let's put that into a small metal thing that will move small people. Oh, the combustion engine, that was smart, yeah fire. Um, so, so yeah, everything leads to something else. I, um, I was trying to find it. Um, it it's not quite related to this, but it, uh, it, I'm watching this thing on Netflix called Omniscient. Um, and, uh, and it has dealing more with privacy, but so it's about the future. And, and they have these really tiny bots that follow you around everywhere and they're supposedly stopping crime and it's that. Um, but it was, it was, it's, it's, you know, it's taking technology that one step further um, in dealing with privacy. Um, it, it might be a fun thing for us at some point to discuss and in, in, in where we're going in the future. But um, I, I think sure I saw the description in Danish, something about someone trying to solve a, a murder. Yeah. Does, yeah. Yeah. And, and having a surveillance drone. He it's, tries it's to pretty outsmart. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's it's really fascinating where where the world's going, and, and and I'm not a doomsday sayer yet as far as you know the end of the world with technology taking over. Of course, I also watched the new Terminator, which it's the first Terminator movie I've I've seen in quite a while where I thought it was terrible. Um, yeah, it wasn't bad. <laughs> yeah. I, I haven't seen it, so, okay. so yeah, there were some I'm, very funny parts. Um, yeah, to be. nice. nice. Um, so so Jackie made a. Um, uh, a an interesting point. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I'd like to expand on it. Um, in that the 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 realm of AI is uh, very very use case specific, um, mm. and and I will I'll give you uh, I, I actually have an example of, of a typical problem that's that's very simple to follow, uh, and. Uh, and it's the, a, a lot of people's newer phones have, have this technology on them where you can point your camera at something and you can, it will try to recognize what you're looking at. Uh, however, uh, when we get to, uh, not this, sorry, uh, when we get to recognizing food or chihuahuas um it, we're, we're still not there um the the best ais still cannot isolate the chihuahuas from the muffins 
Um, and the AIs are either written to recognize a Chihuahua or a Muffin, but not both. Uh, the use cases are very specific and uh, the AIs are um, very, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, one track minded. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a chat bot for a bank isn't plug and play to the chat bot for a pharmacy, mm -hmm. right? They, they both understand natural language, but their, their knowledge base is very specific. Uh, and uh, so, so this is, uh, it's an interesting point. It's the reason why AI isn't more popular, not in addition to the fact that it's very pricey, uh, but it, it is the other reason why it hasn't really taken off is because they are so one track minded. Well, to be yeah. fair to the bots, I actually want to eat either one of those. So um. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have an example and I've used it in another pro podcast before with with deep learning and and image recognition as well and and mm, categorizing of what's in the image and and in this case it was a lot of images and dogs and wolves and um, this deep learning is, is kind of a black box thing going on but it it ended up being really really good at differentiating when is it a wolf and when is it a dog and they're really happy. It had a maybe 98% pre precision or something like that until they shifted the base that they were actually letting it look at. Mm. And it just missed the point completely. And they ended up having to dissect all of what it had done. And what it turned out to be was that in the first sample of images it had learned from all the wolves would be in snowy backgrounds so it had learned to simply just look at all the right white color and not actually at the, the animal in the image just the background was what it made its choice uh, from so yeah these these systems can really be kind of a has been miss so so on and now i think i think we talked about this before we started recording um i had mentioned i think both these guys that uh this weekend i'm going to a uh a, a meetup on um what in the world's a call but it's it's on it's on future um my my buddy is a futurist and the meetup is to to try to brainstorm on possible future crimes right not to commit them but we're basically going to help police kind of know what to look out for and i think we just tied it all back in, right, Jackie? Because with exactly what you said, like we can think about algorithms that people are gonna be writing and how they do stuff. And how would I actually trick, you know, an algorithm, you know, and do something to to put in my my account number hidden in a way that it the computer finds it instead of someone else's account number, whatever it is, right? Um, it, it, I think that ties in really well with that of they, they it, you know what that reminds me of is the, uh, that's the Jurassic World, the very first one, where um, they're talking about how many dinosaurs are there, and there's like, oh, there's 127. Why do we know that? Because we looked for 127 and we found 127, therefore there's 127. Well, what if you unbind that and let it look for as many, you know, it found 200 or whatever, right? I mean, it's, it, it does what we tell them to do um, in these restrictions, right, in that model. Yeah. I, I saw it was a news item or whatever it was today of someone over this weekend um, having tricked Google Maps into believing there were traffic jams where there were. I saw that. Yeah, and, and I, I was like, oh, how did he do that? And when I read it, he was just using the most simple method of all. He took 100 phones and put them in a small red wagon. And then he pulled that in walking speed on roads. And Google Maps thought, hey, here is a traffic jam. A hundred people are moving slowly on this road. Even so, though there's tons of people possibly going by him. 
right? The, the, you know. Whatever it might have been, I, I didn't read every last part of it, but it was just like, yeah, he, he might not have hacked it, he, but he cheated the system, yes, but it's just a fun small thing he had done, but yeah, it, it's just... So weird. for the future crime, that'll be, I have a coffee store that's right here that is, um, no one drives by it because they all go here and there's an easy on-ramp to the freeway. And so I might go do exactly what you just did, Jackie. And those people that are looking at traffic jams on their phone go like, man, that sucks. I'm going to go this way. Oh, hey, today this guy has a big sign out saying, come in, avoid the traffic jams and come in, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, uh, Google navigation will reroute you around traffic jams. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I thought it usually says like which way do you want to go, right? But it'll say it'll, um, it'll say this way is this much longer, right? But I I, I know from I, I use the navigation system on my iPhone, so it, it's a, a bit different system. I can't remember who Apple is partnering with. I think it's Garmin or something. But the I know it comes up and tells me, oh, you know what? You can save three minutes if you go this route. And I just need to click it, and it will reroute to that route. And and I love that feature just because, oh, uh, why not save three minutes, right? And if that becomes just a tad more automatic, and it doesn't really ask me, sure. If the first route it, it gives me or suggests it has gone around a, a traffic jam already, I, I wouldn't even know. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, th this was a lot of fun. We we turned a, a five minute video, I think, into an hour and a half or something. <laughs> nice. So we try to we, there. We we actually call these short talks. Tank. I don't know if you know that. So so <laughs> they're rarely actually short. But um, yeah. Let, let's go ahead and cut it off here. Maybe maybe we'll have you back again another time and pick sure. topics. This was a lot of Absolutely. fun. Thanks for joining us. Nice. Yep. All right, yeah. everyone. Thank you. Uh, bye. bye.